The pain was so great that sometimes I wanted to take my life. But then you just get loaded again and keep trenching and keep moving forward, you know. And the despair, the loneliness that you feel when you're deep in addiction, whether it's heroin, whether it's methamphetamine, whether alcohol is driving your life, that despair and hopelessness that you feel, it's hard to reach out. It's hard to come up for air. It's hard to see a solution. It's really difficult at times. And, uh, but we have to remember that's its job. That's what it's, that's its job. And, uh, and it was beating me down pretty good for a long time. My mom tried to do everything she could, and, uh, but uh, um, unfortunately, um, it wasn't enough. You know, there's, uh, I guess I had, to, I had to hit a bottom, and my bottom wasn't there yet. It's unfortunate what we have to go through fighting addiction and being stuck in that web and trying to get out, how many lumps we have to take, you know. Um, I would wish that our bottoms would, would raise way up here you know, you make a few mistakes, you, you, you recognize and you, and you move forward where, you know, a guy like me had to take a few extra lumps, I guess. And my mom was my rock for a lot of, a lot of years, you know. Um, she, uh, you know, I remember, I, I still, today, um, I picture her on the edge of the mat, just screaming and yelling, you know. Your biggest of, cheerleader. Huh? Your biggest my biggest cheerleader. fan, you know, biggest cheerleader. Hundreds of fans, everybody's rocking and yelling, and my mom's above all the loudest one and yelling and screaming. And, and I still think about it, you know, I still think about it. I still picture her. And when, when you're caught up in addiction, it's hard to reach people. It's hard to reach them. They've got to come up for air. But you get that one window of hope, that one moment that they're feeling like they want to make change. You want to be there for them. You want to be there for them. You want to be ready for that moment because it's going to be difficult to crack through. Um, if I don't want to get help, and I don't want to change my life, or I'm not recognizing the problem, it's going to be difficult to find, find a solution and get the help you need. But as soon as they come up for air, be there to grab them and help them. Be right there, you know. That's when you grab them. Teach them what's going on. Teach them why not to take these drugs, you know. So they can Teach see them. it firsthand. Exactly, you know, sit down and read it with them. Watch the videos, watch the stuff with them and talk about it, you know? It's, it's about the connecting with your kids and, um, and, and educate yourself, you know? Why don't we do it? Well, you know what, this is why, son or daughter, because this is why. We have 175 people a day that are dying heroin overdose. Get on there and get it on the computer and say, this is why. On this week's episode of American Real, we bring to you an intense conversation with Richard Jensen. Richard talks to us about the dangers of drugs and drug addiction and how he overcame all the odds stacked against him. He also went back to school and became a championship wrestler, and his story was featured as a documentary on ESPN. I hope you enjoy this episode, and if so, please share it with your friends on Facebook and Twitter Follow us on Instagram, and please subscribe to our YouTube channel, American Real TV. I'd like to thank our partners and sponsors, especially Happy Socks, turning an everyday essential into a colorful design item. I'll be wearing Happy Socks each and every episode. And now, without further ado, I bring to you Mr. 
Richard Jensen. Welcome to American Real. This is Roger Brooks, and today my very special guest is Richard Jensen, U.S. wrestling champion, motivational speaker, and your story won a National Sports Emmy on ESPN. Rich, welcome to the show. Thanks, Roger. And thank you for being here today. I know you uh, you, you made some time for us uh, out of your busy schedule. You're on a you're on a major speaking tour, so so we appreciate that. And we both have something in common. Uh, I lived out in Portland, Oregon for, for six years of my life. You live in Portland. And um, tell us about Portland. Tell us uh, what, uh, what's going on in that remarkable city these days. Well, you know, it's a great place for fishing, hunting, camping. You know, uh, everybody talks about the rain. But, you know, I spent most of my life in Oregon. So I've traveled off and on throughout the years and always went back to home. You know, beautiful country. we got the ocean within a couple hours. We got Mount Hood skiing and outdoors a couple hours the other way, and you know it's just a just a real nice place to live. Yeah, and for a lot of the people that have not been to the Pacific Northwest, it's really um, so much different than the rest of the country. I think there's 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 a vibe there that I, I don't know. It's just a really nice feeling, and I, I love being out out in the Pacific Northwest. It is you you know you little little bit more laid back you know the more conservative relaxed um, I mean we still have our road rage and some issues but you know at the end of the day it's it's a little it's maybe a little behind in time it's than some regions you know some demographics but uh, but yeah yeah it's, it's a good place to raise kids so tell us about your upbringing what was it like growing up there I know you grew up a little bit outside of Portland what, did you grow up in the city itself, or was it? Yeah, uh, I grew up in the suburbs. You know, okay. actually, for till age twelve, I was in uh, Northeast Portland, right in uh, in in Portland, uh, and then uh, you know, my baseball coach got uh, connected with my my mom, and she started scorekeeping, and then the next thing you know, they hit it off, and uh, and uh, he moved us out of there, out to Tigard. It's in the suburbs. Yes, it's about a half an hour south, and near Beaverton. It is. It is. Yep, and. Uh, you know, uh, I always call it the greener grasses. You know, it's like you took us from there and then moved us out there, and it's it's just the greener grasses, a little nicer. Uh, um, and uh, and so I, I went through school out in, in uh, graduated from Tiger High School. You know, raised with seven kids in the family. You know, so once we can combine the families, you know, uh, I had quite a few kids, quite a few siblings, and and I was right in the middle. A um, couple older brothers and a couple, you know, a younger sister and couple of younger brothers and so uh, you know it was a it was a it was a Brady bunch you know <laughs> sounds like it yeah, yeah. so uh, I, I had a chance to watch uh, the ESPN documentary yesterday which we'll get to in, in time um, so I'm, I'm interested to hear about how and when you got started with with wrestling yeah so when uh, I was a really really high strung kid really hyperactive you know um, case of ADHD and, and I was just had more energy than than 10 kids and so um, and I was on medication at the time young and, and when we moved out to Tigard uh, I went to a place called Durham Elementary and uh, and I registered there and, and over time I figured they, they said they had a little wrestling team and uh, you know I was in the, about the fourth grade and I, I said hey I want to try this mom it looks like something I would I would enjoy and uh, so I went out for the, I went and started wrestling with the kids. And uh, next thing you know, uh, it was, uh, I found my spot, I found my sport. It was like medicine to me, you know? And I was able to actually get off the medication. I could channel so much energy through that sport, um, just exhausting myself and working hard and wrestling that, you know, I, I actually, um, it became kind of a medicine for me. I found, I found uh, a purpose. I found a little bit of identity, you know? And as a young kid, it's really important because, we're so insecure and so self-conscious. We kind of got to hopefully carve and find our way at that young age and, and, and help help guide them over the years because um, it's, a, it's a big issue. You know, I was a very insecure kid, um, but I uh, enjoyed wrestling from early on and uh, wrestled all through high school. Um, it was the one thing that I tapped into that kept me on track. It helped me stay focused. It helped me stay on track and actually that's probably the main key element that helped me get through high school and graduate from high school was wrestling. It was a key element. So, uh, I, I know it was a big part of your life. Um, were, you, were you determined to take this to a higher level? 
uh, when you were young, or, or was it, you know, just a, you know, a, a sport that you did to, to fill time? Uh, how, you know, how much involved were you with the sport? Well, you have to, you have to real. I'm not, uh, I'm not standing at the top of the podium. I'm not the the, the wrestler that's winning all the time. You know, I didn't. Um, didn't have a lot of huge offers to go to college with scholarships, but but I had offers, you know. Um, I was, uh, um, you know, I was probably a 500 or a little over wrestler. Um, so it wasn't my record that was going to, uh, you know, uh, move me into a college. It was that character that I was at the time. You know, I was the inspiration on the team. I fought and kicked and scratched the whole match, you know. And so, uh, and I'd win a lot of matches towards the end because I'd just keep on fighting. And so I was like the driving force of the team. So, uh, and that's as important as the guy winning, sure. because that's what really inspires the team. And so, um, it was important. It, it, I found my spot, and um, you know, the, the the key element was I got through high school, and my coach called Clackamas Community College, talked to the athletic director, talked to the the um, wrestling coach at the time back in 1989 and uh, you know said hey listen I got this wrestler you know he's got a lot of heart he's got a lot of drive he inspires the team you know I think he, he might be able to be something but he really needs an opportunity and so uh, with that said you know I had an opportunity to go to Clackamas Community College in 1990 um, and, uh, and that's really where, that's where my focus was. I was like, hey, I'm gonna get an education. I'm gonna be able to be a, 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 a college athlete um, and, uh, and pursue uh, my goal to having an automotive degree, you know, and, and maybe help coach a team at some point. But that was my vision back then, you know. And I it sounds like that was a nice breakthrough for you at the time. Yeah, oh man, that was a huge opportunity for me, yeah. you know. I wasn't a, a you know, I had a, a a mediocre to lower grade point average. I was a you know 500 slight over wrestler, you know. So you know there was a, a little less opportunities at the time. So that was a massive, massive door open for me. So let's talk about your story and where your first addiction began. How, how old were you? Yeah. Do you remember where where you were? Do you remember what it was? I do. I do. So. So the, the summer between high school and college, you know, here I am, I'm focusing on college, I'm ready to go. I'm starting to visualize myself, you know, being part of the team and, 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 and going, to, going to college, man. And uh, that summer I went off and to go fishing, you know, I had an opportunity to go fishing in Alaska and in the, in the fish canneries and, and make some money uh, salmon, uh, salmon fishing and, and um, you know, I was going to go make some summer money, come back and have some, some cash and go to college. And that was the goal. That was the vision. That was it. And uh, unfortunately, that isn't how it played out. You know, I, I hadn't really experimented too much through school. I hadn't been exposed to too much drugs or alcohol. You know, I came from a real um, uh, a good family, family values, you know, a good belief system. And, and, and I wasn't really exposed to a lot of that. But when I went off, here I am, this young kid with the lack of tools and knowledge and you know hadn't been exposed to to the world till this moment and uh, went up to Alaska and I started experimenting with drugs and experimenting with alcohol and, and how did that happen was it peer pressure how did yeah yeah well you know here's you're talking about a kid that's young um, and fairly insecure about himself and really wants to fit in you know it's one of the one of the issues we battle right now these kids are so insecure and and uh, self-conscious and they want to fit in so well and have the right shoes and have the right phone and make sure they look right and talk right because you know they become a target and so but um, they're very insecure and um, I fought with that for a long time and so when I got out there you know the the um, I didn't want them not to like me I didn't want them not to accept me I didn't want them to not include me because that's all I wanted was to be included to be a part of and um, and I kind of figured if I didn't join in with the party, join in with the drinking, and join in with everybody else, um, that they might not like me. They might not accept me, you know. Um, and, and that's a big, uh, it's a tough lifestyle up there. It really was in the early 90s, you know, a lot of drinking, a lot of partying, you know, fishing hard, and, and just a rough, rough lifestyle. So take us through a, a typical day. What, what would happen on a typical day with, with this between the, the work itself and then the, the partying, and, and if you if you can, yeah. Well, um, you know the the you know the first summer first it's it's a progression. 
it's a progression. You know, the first summer I'm getting exposed to alcohol and getting exposed to some methamphetamine and, and the, you know, the first summer it's just getting exposed to it. And I'm working 12, 16 hours a day, um, partying at night and, um, you know, maybe clocking 80 to a hundred hours a week. You know, it's a lot, it's a lot. And, uh, um, and when you're partying at night, is it still on, on the boat? Are you still out no, that, at sea well, or you come back? Well, that year, that first year out, I was on land. You know, I was on land. So, uh, you know, I have to realize I fished for five or six years. And it progressed and it went from, you know, let's, and let's touch on that. Let's talk about that, that, um, that period of time, okay? Um, five or six years I fished in Alaska. And it progressed from a fishing, ten, uh, a fishing uh, working on the, in the cannery, uh, Petersburg, Alaska. And then I got on to a... Uh, um, uh, salmon tender and then a, a crab uh, processing boat out at sea and then uh, um, I graduated up to pitch in crab on the deck as a deckhand and then I became a commercial king crab fisherman you know this is the progression I, I kind of climbed that ladder of the fishing industry over a four or five year period and are they paying you more money as you yeah absolutely absolutely um, I'm making more money um, I'm I'm you know I, I miss the college I missed college you know, went out fishing, came back with a habit, and I missed college. I didn't go. I didn't go. So I went back out fishing, you know, and so I missed the boat then. And then I I just decided that, you know, I'm going to be fishing, you know. I thought that was everything. They got all the girls. They had all the money. I was going to find my way up the ladder, you know, once I missed that boat to go to college back then. And um, I didn't know that it was gonna miss co I was going to skip out on college 15 years. But at the time, I thought, okay, it'll be fine. I'll just I'll go back to school. I'll go to school soon enough. Just go make some more money. And, and But it snowballed into five years, something like that. And, you know, I, I found my way up the ladder and, and shifting boats and shifting jobs and ended up on a commercial king crab fisher boat. And by then I had, you know, I'd come home partying and I had a full-blown habit, you know. I was using methamphetamine and, and drinking and, and uh, you know, it was a, it was a full-time job. And what what does it mean to be a user of methamphetamine? What what is what do you do? What is it? What, what is it? And how does it used? Um, you know, methamphetamine can be used in a lot of different ways. It can be uh, snorted. It can be eaten. It can be injected. You know, um, it's uh, um, you know I got exposed to it uh, then, and and I fought with that addiction for a long time. You know, and it's a it's a chemical, right? A, a manufactured. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, you know, methamphetamine can be made from, from chemicals underneath your sink, in your garage, you know, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of deadly chemicals that are mixed together, and at the end of the day, that any one of them can kill you, um, they mix it all together and, and create uh, a crystal meth, and, um, you know, it, uh, it grabbed a hold of me early on, and I fought with that addiction for a long time. Yeah. Now... While you're there fishing, are a lot of the guys doing the same thing? Are they introducing you to this? And do you just feel in a, you're in a place where there's no way out? Yeah, you know, I, I think once I, once I got involved in it and once it, you know, it, once I got to using it, it, I felt like my insecurities were gone. You know, I felt like the self-consciousness was gone. And I had this sense of motivation and this sense of confidence that, that uh, you know, that that happened through using it and, and I felt like I was on top of the world, mm -hmm. you know. I had no idea that it had a much bigger plan in store. Um, didn't know that it was gonna be years of fighting to get off of it, um, but uh, at the time I think it was, you know, living in the moment and, and feeling invincible and feeling young and feeling like nothing could touch me, you know. Um, and. Uh, and addiction's a gorilla, you know, it's a gorilla. Um, it destroyed everything around me over the years. I was fortunate enough to make a comeback, but, uh, you know, it drove every decision I ever made for a long time. So you go fishing for, for about five years, um, then what happens? Um, I, so the, you know, and, and I'm fishing, uh, come home on, on, a, on an off season and, and I'm partying and, and for a few months and then we're getting ready to go back out on the boat. Um, 
and usually we have a big party the night before, a shove off to go go fishing, have my family and friends all get together and, and party. And and uh, unfortunately, I, I uh, had an altercation with a with a good friend of mine. Of, uh, I've known him most of my life, and uh, and we got into a fight that night over uh, some unresolved issue, and uh, and I ended up going to jail that night. They kicked in the door, took me to jail, and and. Uh, you know, I woke up in jail and realized what had happened, and I missed the, the, the flight to the fishing boat, so I, I you know, basically lost my job. Um, and um, it was one of, the, one of the first real interventions in, you know, the real, where it really impacted me. You know, this is a guy that's like my brother, my family member. I've known him a long time, and, and, and we got into a fight, and... and, and um, it was one of the first real wide eye opener and, and where I could sit back and go, okay, okay, my life is, is going into the dumps. You know, here I am, I'm out of control. Um, I'm really abusing my loved ones. And, uh, you know, a few months in jail, you start thinking about stuff. You start reflecting on your life. You start realizing the path that you're on. And, and you know, you, you recognize um, that things are going downhill. And, um, and I had a lot of guilt and shame around that whole thing for a while. But uh, Was your family aware of what, what was happening with you during this period of time, during this five years of going back and forth? Were they aware? Absolutely. You know, they could see the progression and they could see the, the change in my character. They could see the anger. They could see the, the, um, the change in routine. You know, now I'm not, you know, coming around my family as often. I'm losing weight. I'm... Um, you know, a lot of a lot of warning signs. Did and they intervene? In they did. You bet. My mom tried to do everything she could, and uh, but uh, um, unfortunately, um, it wasn't enough. You know, there's. Uh, I guess I had to. I had to hit a bottom, and my bottom wasn't there yet. And and um, it's unfortunate what we have to go through fighting addiction and being stuck in that web and trying to get out. How many lumps we have to take? You know, um, I would wish that our bottoms would would raise way up here. You know, you make a few mistakes, you, you, you recognize and you, and you move forward where, you know, a guy like me had to take a few extra lumps, I guess, and, and I don't know why that is. And I'm curious, uh, when this was happening at that time, were you aware, were you conscious of the fact that you still haven't, that you still didn't hit the bottom? Were you waiting for that bottom to happen and was, was the fight the start of, of, of that bottom? No, I had no idea. Um, no, my bottom happens 10 more years later, you know. Uh, I had no idea what, I, I actually was in a fog. You know, once that, once your drugs become a priority, once it's right here and your family and everything else becomes secondary, um, you don't, you know, there's, there's certain uh, key elements that have to happen before you really recognize your bottom. And, and I wasn't there yet, I wasn't there yet. I had to learn a few more life lessons. I had to do some more time in jail. I had to hit a, hit a little bit lower low to, to really hit my bottom. And, um, and that was 10 years later, you know. I spent 10 years, I had, I, had, I had a daughter. Right after I was fishing, I had my daughter, Kaylin, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, I was with her mom for about seven or eight years. And, um, you know, she hung on to hope. She hung on to, because um, she knew that I was a great guy. She hung on to that fact that I was going to change, or she was going to help change me, for seven or eight years, and 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 and, it, and I never did. You know, I kept going back, and I kept getting loaded, and I kept going to jail, and you know, um, I drug her around for about seven or eight years, and, and we'd had Kaylin, and uh, about that time, and and she finally packed up and left. You know, she said, "I got to take my daughter and be safe," so she went to California. You know, and um, you know, I wasn't gonna. I wasn't ready to be a father. I wasn't ready to, um, I guess I didn't have the tools or the, the information to be able to get clean and stay clean quite yet. Um, I needed to learn a few more lessons and take, take a few more lumps, I guess. Um, but uh, looking back on it now, it was definitely the right move for my daughter's mom. Mm -hmm. It was the right move. I'm so, so blessed and happy that that happened at that time, you know, because... Uh, um, gave them a chance, mm -hmm. you know, um, but, uh, 
you know, from that point forward, I had, uh, you know, experimented with other drugs, um, cocaine and heroin, and I drank a lot and, um, for another seven years, you know, um, and uh, I was getting in trouble. I was finding myself in jail. Um, from Were you from, working at the time, or was your... You know, uh, that, that last seven years, I didn't work much. Everything was wrapped in around selling drugs and, and manufacturing drugs and, and uh, supplying my habit criminal activity and, and that was really what I resorted to and that's where uh, that's where my life ended up you know for a good six or eight years to till towards the end um, I was really unemployable you know I didn't have the I couldn't stay clean long enough I couldn't uh, get my shit together enough to to get a real job um, and did you reach out to anyone during this point or are you just too much in your own head that you can't you can't even ask for help yeah I was uh, um, uh, there's a lot of guilt and shame and embarrassment that that, that, that comes along with uh, with living that lifestyle um, and the drugs controlled it so much you know that and you beat yourself down so much that your self-esteem is shot and you get to a point where suicide is an option. That's how bad it can get. You get to a point where you feel like, uh, you feel like you don't deserve anything more than what you got. And that's the, the hand of drugs on you, you know. Um, and that's how I felt for a long time. I said, I'm not, never gonna, I don't deserve any more than that. I don't got anything better coming. The pain was so great that sometimes I wanted to take my life. But then you just get loaded again and keep trudging and keep moving forward, you know? And the despair, the loneliness that you feel when you're deep in addiction, whether it's heroin, whether it's methamphetamine, whether alcohol is driving your life, that despair and hopelessness that you feel, it's hard to reach out. It's hard to come up for air. It's hard to see a solution. It's really difficult at times. And, uh, but we have to remember that's its job. That's, what it's, that's its job. And, um, and it was beating me down pretty good for a long time. So going through that, what can we do more or different as far as if our siblings, if our kids, how do we penetrate someone when they're in the midst of this? Because I, I could see how painful, how difficult it is for the individual. How does the person on the other side, how can they penetrate that? Let's just say my mom cried herself to sleep probably many, many, many nights, you know, feeling um, hopeless and feeling like, uh, like her hands were tied or feeling like, the, like, uh, like she failed, you know? And, um, you know, one thing I've learned over time is we have this disconnect between parents and kids today. There's a disconnect. You know, parents are working two jobs. They're trying to, you know, provide for the family. Kids are off. You know, many hours of the day, just, and um, you know, it's about sitting down. You know, I, I, I got off track there, but what I'm, you know, in the midst of addiction, it's going to be difficult to reach them if they don't want to get help. Okay, okay? that was the question you asked me, and I, I ran to a different place with it that we are going to talk about. But um, you know, when 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 you're caught up in addiction, it's hard to reach people. It's hard to reach them. They've got to come up for air. But you get that one window of hope, that one moment that they're feeling like they want to make change. You want to be there for them. You want to be there for them. You want to be ready for that moment because it's going to be difficult to crack through. Um, if I don't want to get help and I don't want to change my life or I'm not recognizing the problem, it's going to be difficult to find, find a solution and get the help you need. But as soon as they come up for air, be there to grab them and help them. 
be right there, you know. That's when you grab them. Okay. Inspire them to make change, you know. Um, I think a really important element is, is starting to talk to these kids at a younger age, yeah. you know. We've got to start talking to them at a little younger age because they're getting ex- exposed to it at a younger age. And there's, there's massive problems out there right now, you know. We've got massive issues. And, um, you know, I'm a firm believer that it starts by educating and talking at a little younger age and exposing them to what's going on out there and the dangers of it. It's and not, what is that young age? I mean, it's not it 10, 11, I, yeah. you know, seriously. I think, uh, you know, I speak to fifth grade all the way up, you know, and so I think it's, it's important to hit them early. And I'm sure when you talk to fifth graders, it's a different discussion than if you're talking to high school. Absolutely. absolutely. So what, what are you saying to fifth grade? You have to know your audience, you know, and, and, uh, you know, I think that... Uh, um, My son's in sixth grade, so yeah, yeah. What, what, what would you say yeah. to a sixth grader or a fifth grader? Yeah, well, you know, here, here's, here's, here's what I... If My kids are grown now, okay? But what I would do is I would sit down with my son or my daughter and I would get on the internet. Because, see, I, I as a father, I'm a, I know what it's like to be out there in addiction. But maybe, maybe there's fathers that don't. Maybe there's mothers that don't know. But they see it on the TV, they see it on the internet, they know there's a problem out there and they have concerns for their kids. You sit down with them. You can't tell my kid anymore what to do and what not to do. It's not enough. You know, hey, don't do drugs. Right. Well, why? I, I can't share a story about it. You know, I can, but some people can't. But what you can do is get on the internet and start Googling the epidemic, Googling heroin, Googling the statistics. There's stories, there's stuff on there. You sit down and teach them. Teach them what's going on. Teach them why not to take these drugs, you know. So they can see it firsthand. Exactly, you know, sit down and read it with them, watch the videos, watch the stuff with them and talk about it, you know. It's, it's about the connecting with your kids and, um, and, and educate yourself, you know. Why don't we do it? Well, you know what, this is why, son or daughter, because this is why. We have 175 people a day that are dying of heroin overdose. Get on there and get it on the computer and say, this is why. I love you, I care about you, I want you to be here tomorrow, this is why, you know? And we all seem to know someone who's been affected today. I mean, it's happening right here in our town. It seems every week I hear another story of a family that we know, you know? So it's not, uh, it's not maybe like it was 20, 30 years ago where you may have heard of a friend or someone that overdosed and died. Right. Today it's people that come like you from good families and it's too late. Yeah. Rich, tell us about your mom. My mom was my rock for a lot of a lot of years, you know. Um, she uh, you know, I remember I, I still today um, I picture her on the edge of the mat, just screaming and yelling, you know. Your Hundreds biggest cheerleader. Of, huh? Your biggest, my biggest fan, you know, biggest cheerleader. Hundreds of fans, everybody's rocking and yelling, and my mom's above all the loudest one and yelling and screaming. And, and I still think about it, you know, I still think about it. I still picture her, you know. Um, and, um, you know, uh, I was her little red. Unfortunately, um, you know, when, so I've been clean over 14 years now. I Congratulations. Pick, yeah, yeah, I haven't picked up a drug or a drink in 14 years. And so um, for me, um, my very bottom, the key elements that, that played in, the things that had to come together at the right time for me to really make change, you know, was uh, in 2003. Um, October 10th, 2003 to be exact, I got arrested and shortly before that I, I had saw my daughter for the first time in two years. I had abandoned my kids and I robbed them of time and, uh, and that affected me greatly. And there was, um, a couple of other things happened that were very powerful in my life and then I got arrested and I went to the Oregon State Penitentiary. And I was in the penitentiary with the killers and the rapists with the real bad guys, and uh, and that's not me, you know, that's not me. Um, but while I was there, um, it was a big eye opener because, um, you know, a drug deal gone bad, another bad decision. I could have ended up with worse 
charges been in a whole lot more trouble um, and uh, and my mom passed away while I was there mm-hmm. and, and uh, it it really rocked my world you know this culmination of things came together at the same time and um, and I realized that uh, that I needed to make change and I was doing enough time to where I had a chance to really kind of evaluate and recognize and try to shift my gears a little bit. I did a little over a year in that in that prison. Between that prison and I, I transferred to another one, but it was a little over a year. And it was, it was released the day after Thanksgiving 2004. Okay. It's a little different focus. At that point, were you feeling, okay, I need to change my life and in some ways for your mom. I did, I did. It was really important to honor my mom. Um, and I'd said it for years and, and I'd never really been able to stay clean. You know, I tried, I wanted to, but um, you know, this time was different. I felt different getting released. And um, I didn't know how I was gonna do it. I didn't know where to go or what to do, but I knew that I wanted to stay sober. I wanted to stay clean. and. Uh, you know, I was released from the from the um, uh, from the prison in Portland. Um, the day after Thanksgiving, I took the city bus downtown, and I was um, I was uh, paroled to the Salvation Army. It's a homeless shelter, mm-hmm. and uh, <clears throat> and I remember one of the one of the instrumental things I did was on the way there I took my little phone book that I had all those 15 years of phone numbers in it and all those relations and all those friends and connections and and it was very difficult it was excruciatingly hard to take that phone book and throw it out the window and start fresh and uh, that was one of the things I did I realized I needed to change that whole I needed to shut that 15 years off I needed to start over I needed to insulate myself with good, positive people. I needed to try to insulate myself with people staying sober, moving in a good, positive direction. I understood that. And as hard as it was, you know, because that's your identity. That's who you are for a long time. Um, I was able to do that. And when I, when I was at the homeless shelter, I remember standing in line and, uh, you know, some of these guys came out from under the bridge. Um, some of them have been on the street for years. But I knew that if I stood in that line, they only took 100 in at night to the gym floor. Okay. Just lay on the gym floor, and then they kick you out in the morning. And as hard as it was, I wanted to go get loaded. I wanted to go get loaded. The guilt and the shame and the embarrassment, and here I am, this is what life, you know. I didn't want to be in my feelings. The day after Thanksgiving, 04. And, but I knew if I could stand in that line and I could go in that gym and lay on that floor, that, uh, that I was willing to do whatever it took. I knew that. And if I could just do this, then I might have a chance. I might have a chance at just staying sober for, you know, for a time being. I, I had a chance and I did that. I did that. Good for you. $32 to my name, the clothes on my back. I stood in line and I went in there and, uh, for a month, six weeks, I did that. And uh, during that month to six weeks, I, I understood I needed help. I needed treatment. I needed uh, counseling. I needed AA. I needed help. I, I did, you know. Couldn't do it alone. I, I needed. I, I understood that I had no money though. I had no insurance. I had no. Um, there was nothing available. I, I went to a bunch of treatment centers downtown. I'm knocking on doors. I went to five or six different treatments. Said, "Hey, I'm here. I'm sober. I just got out of jail." I'm, I'm living down here at the homeless shelter. I, I need crying for I help. Need, yeah, I need treatment. I need it. You know, I want to. I don't want to get loaded again. And um, sorry, we don't have room. We're full. Sorry, you don't have insurance. Sorry, you don't have any money. Sorry, you're not court ordered. And so uh, I did that for for a month. And uh, I was at a point where I was feeling like I wasn't going to get that help. I really know I needed and that uh, I was on the verge of going to go get loaded. You didn't want to slip, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I want to go get out of my feelings. Fine, here it is again. There's, you know, there it is again. Poor me, you know. 
Um, another reason to go sell out. It wasn't meant to be, you know, um, but I hung on. And I went to, um, one morning I went to a coffee shop and I recognized a guy in there, Jimmy, and, uh, and he looked clean, he looked, he looked good, man, he looked great. And I went, to, I went, hey Jimmy, how you doing, man? And he goes, hey Red, I'm good. And I, I remember that this is where, this is where my ego almost took over, you know, and my armor started to jump. I wanted to, I wanted to, oh, I'm good, I'm good. Yeah, no, things are great, you know, when things were horrible. And uh, if I had done that, I would, that, that the magic wouldn't have happened that day, you know? It would have changed the whole course of, of the future because uh, your first reaction was, oh, no, I'm good, man. And um, I broke down, I said, hey, Jimmy, I'm messed up, man. I need some help. I'm scared, I wanna go get loaded. I'm down at the homeless shelter, you know? And uh, he said, well, man, I've been clean a year and a half. I'm in a program, why don't I come introduce you to, to the, to the, to the, the counselor down here. I said, oh man, that'd be great. And so, uh, you know, that was when it happened. He took me over to meet a guy named Dave Fitzgerald and he's all tattooed up, his arms, looked like he's just came out of prison. <laughs> and I was like, wow, what? He'd been clean 25 years. He'd done a lot of years, a lot of time, but he'd been clean 25 years. He's the head counselor in this treatment center, you know, and, and mentor program. And, and I was like, holy cow. And he said, you know, so I told him my story and shared with him what I was doing. And, and he said, well, check in with me every day at eight o'clock in the morning. And we'll see if we can find your spot. And at the time I didn't know it was a test. Yeah. Because if you, most guys will fall off, you know, over that couple weeks. They go get loaded, they get relapse. How serious are you? Right. Is it the most important thing in your life or isn't it? You know, and- um, How I long should, did you do that for? Two weeks, I showed up every morning at eight o'clock in the morning. And um, I, I'll never forget it. The, the, the morning I came in and he said, I got you a bed, you know? And so my life changed from that day forward, you know? And I haven't got loaded since, you know? Wow. Phenomenal. That's phenomenal. So, before we go too far ahead, I just I had a couple of questions about prison because mm -hmm. I think it's important to talk about. Not too many people talk about it openly. And um, you said it was a scary place. It was a bad place. How bad was it? Well, there's a lot of levels of prison. There's minimum security, medium security, and uh, maximum security. You know, I've done some time and a little bit of all of them, you know. Um, there's a lot of segregation. Um, it's, a, it's a scary place, you know. There's, there's crime inside the prison, too. There's drugs in the prison, too. How does that you've happen? Gotta, they get them in there, you know. Um, and you've got to work at, you know, you've got to work at it. You've got to make it important, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, I just remember how, uh, how hard it was to not want to be included and be part of that last time I went to prison. And, uh, but I completely alienated myself away from everybody else, you know. I wanted to focus on me. I didn't buy into to all the segregation. I tried not to hang out with, you know, with anybody. I just tried to focus on my kids focus on staying sober and focus on be trying to just get a get my head on right while I was there uh, but uh, so it sounds like you matured in that last right time right you were there I, right yeah. yeah I went to church I went to some AA meetings I went to some groups I went to some uh, some self-help groups they have stuff in there you know if you want to access it you know it just it helps graze the surface a little exposes you a little to some new ideas and change your gear set a little bit you know and, uh, and that's what I did. I went to a lot of groups while I was there. And, um, and it was valuable, you know, it kind of gave me a sense that, you know, there, there, could be a, there could be a different life out there if you, if you really went after it. That's great. So Jimmy was your angel. Yeah. And then Dave was your savior. Yeah. And now, you, you now you're onto a path of new, right? Yeah. So what happens? Yeah. We're, we're, they woke we're, the beast. They woke the beast. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Where did uh, what happened with your life at that point? Well, you know, so so I went. Uh, I bought in. I bought in right away. I, I believed in the process. I believed in the program. I um, I believed that I spent 15 years messing up my life and making bad choices, and I knew that it was going to take time to to really get where I needed to be. It wasn't going to happen overnight, um, but I knew that I needed to trust in the process and. So I went through six months of, of, of treatment, and I went to uh, an ex- another three months of a mentoring program, and then I went to an, a sober living, Oxford sober living house for another year. And so it's a long process, you know, and a guy like me needed to make sure he stayed in it for the long process. And, um, and I made it important. I knew that I believed in the process, and, and a few years, it, it was a few years of reprogramming, and I went to um, self-help groups, and I went to... AA and NA for years, you know, and I and, um, started to build some confidence and uh, started to realize that, you know, I don't ever have to go back there. Um, and uh, I wanted to get a degree really bad. And during that time, I started, I remember, I remember during that time, I was playing a sober league softball league, uh, softball, and, and I kept telling everybody, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I want to be on a wrestling team. I want to be on a wrestling team, you know, and, uh, and they thought I was nuts. And how old are you at this time? And you're Late um, 20s? Yeah, I'm 35. I'm 30, 35. I'm 35, you know. I'm, I'm 35, 36. So people are thinking wrestling. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've been sober a couple years, yeah. you know. And, and I'm like, you know, I, I want to be part of the wrestling team again. And uh, I missed the boat back in 89 when I should have been off to college. And here I am. I'm sober a couple years. Never had a couple years sober. Feeling good. Feeling confident. And it's like, you know, I, I want to be part of the wrestling team again. I knew that if I could restructure my life around the sport of wrestling, that it would help give me a chance and find success in other areas, you know, because it brought so much value. Um, and so, um, and at the time it wasn't, it wasn't a pipe dream to me. I believed that I could be part of the team, you know, hadn't used any eligibility. I, I'm going back to college. Why not? You know? Um, uh, and so I went to, uh, and everybody thought I was nuts. They're like, no, you can't do that. You're 30. <laughs> You're too old. You're, you're, right. you're, you're, you know, you're an ex-convict. You're, you know, you just can't do it. I go, what do you mean? You know, so, uh, but, you know, I didn't think I could stay sober two years either. And, um, and there I was. So, um, so I went back to Portland Community College for a year. Um, that was my first mission was to get up to college level. So I spent a year getting, um, taking classes to get to the college level. And then once I hit once I was up to the college level, then I could transfer to Clackamas Community College and I could be part of the team. Or at least I, I could go to Clackamas Community College and I thought I could be part of the team, you know? So, uh, so I did, you know, I did that year and then I went and registered at Clackamas Community College. I went and talked to the athletic director and he thought I was kind of nuts and he goes, you know, many people have tried. You forget how demanding it is and how much you have to sacrifice and you, your body just can't take it, you know? You're, 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 You'll be lucky to make it through the first couple of weeks during Iron Man, where they where they thin the herd, and uh, you know I left there, and what I heard was there was a slim chance that you could do it. You know I heard you got a Don't shot. Don't give you that yeah, opening. <laughs> just a little chance, and so um, so yeah, so I was excited all summer, and, and I was just couldn't wait for school to start to be part of the team. You know I was uh, 36 years old. I had. Uh, you must have been so proud. Oh man. What a what a moment! It was the the biggest, most positive decision I could ever make at that moment. You know, it was like it was like just raising the bar way up here, and going, you know what? I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it. And uh, I knew the value it would bring to my life. I knew that I needed. I had this void inside of me for so long that I was trying to fill. And part of that void was that I that I missed being part of the team for so long. And that if I could be part of the team, I knew that that that, that was where I was supposed to be. You know, um, you know, it was about winning in life. I knew that I would win in life. I didn't expect to get my hand raised in the mat when I start. I mean, I figured I'd get my clock clean. You know, but at the end of the day, I wanted to make it through a season. You know, I wanted to make it through a college season and be part of the team. Right. And um, and I did. You know, it was a massive comeback year. You know. Uh, I lost almost all my matches, you know. Uh, I won like two matches the whole year, and um, here but it I wasn't am. about that, right? It was about just being there. 
It was. It was just about being part of the team, and it was about being healthy and focusing on goals, and you know, uh, being an athlete again, where I was, where, where life was so good for me years ago, being an athlete, you know. Um, and uh, here I was. I was ten years older than the coaches. I was twenty years older than the athletes. I mean, um, and uh, everybody thought. It was just weird. It was awkward for a while. And then pretty soon I became part of the team. They realized that I brought life experience onto the mat. And the, the reason that I was there, they understood. And uh, So you weren't only accepted, you were embraced, it was, sounds like. I was embraced big time. Became a, an extension of the coach's arm. I became the guy that the kids leaned on. Um, became an inspiration on the team. It changed the dynamics in that wrestling room. And a lot of the kids started making different choices too during their their uh, their window of opportunity you know they started changing their habits and it was just magic it was really magic and um, you know the uh, at the end of that first year I, I had a decision to make though did I come back and do what I came to do I, and I could have probably stopped right there but um, I was looking for that window of opportunity my whole entire life I made it through the season and I knew that this was that moment where I push a little harder. So I trained all summer. I trained all summer and I lost another 20 pounds and I came in at another weight class down. And I started the second season in shape, you know? And um, I remember uh, the very first tournament of the season. The season started within a month, we had our first tournament and, and I won three matches that day. And it was already more than I won the whole year before. Yeah, so. Um, so it really built my confidence up a little bit, and, and, uh, and it excited me, and I felt like, man, I'm, I'm gonna, now I start thinking about winning, you know? Um, and uh, so, as you know, we went on to have a winning season, and uh, we took second in the region, I won a whole lot of matches, and went off to compete at the, at the national tournament. Um, I'm one of the oldest that's ever competed at the junior college national tournament. I was 37 years old at the time. And, um, that's when ESPN jumped on board. You know, they they were blown away. So how'd they find you? So I get a call. Um, let's see, I'm, I'm, I'm seated second in the region. I'm getting ready to compete for the national qualifier. And it's at Clackamas Community College. It's at home uh, this year. And I get the call and they, they uh, I had, there's an article, uh, Jim Basita, who put an article in the Oregonian, that's the state paper in Oregon, and, and it did a two page front page, front uh, the sports page article. Great spread about, you know, here I am 37 years old, I'm, I'm seated second, I'm competing at the, for, for the national qualifier, and a little bit of history in there. And so, um, so people bought in, they're like, oh my God, this old guy's competing on the college team. And then they find out my history and they're going, wow. So uh, ESPN grabbed a hold of the story, they made a phone call and they were blown away by where I came from, where I'm at, and then I'm on the wrestling team getting ready to qualify for nationals. And so they asked if they could follow me around and, and, and video the regionals and follow me to nationals if I qualify and, and get the story. You know, They didn't guarantee it would be aired, but they wanted to come get the story. And so I said, well, yeah. So that's how it all began. And they followed you for how long? Yeah, they followed me for, for a month, you know. They, they followed me through some training before regionals. They videoed the whole regional tournament. That's the national qualifier. And I ended up winning my way through, and I got into the finals, and I lost in the finals, but I placed second, which qualified me for the national tournament. And then uh, they did a bunch of one-on-one uh, -on -one interviews, and then they followed us to Rochester, Minnesota for the national tournament. And, um, and they were wrapped all around the mat, getting interviews and video, and, and, and it was just, uh, it was incredible, you know. And for to get that kind of media at, at, in wrestling is, is, you know, doesn't happen very Challenging often. Challenging anyway. Yeah. yeah, and then you got it at the junior college level. Right. It's a pretty big deal for Clackamas. It's a big deal for me, too, exposing the story and giving hope out there. Right. I didn't realize what it, I didn't realize the level of what it was going to turn into over years. But at the time, it was kind of exciting to be able to, you know, tell my story and, um, and uh, you know, just share the comeback, you know. And, and I felt good about it. I felt proud. I felt like I'd accomplished something massive. And, um, and I think that really helped, you know, those, those couple years and finding wins and getting some success really helped, you know, um, give me more reason to stay clean, you know. Absolutely. And when does the movie come out? How long after that? 
Um, six months. Yeah. Yeah. So within six months, the they they aired it on on back then it was outside the lines. Now it's E60 right. and and uh, so they. Uh, did you get a phone call? How did they? How did they give you the news that it was actually going to air? I did. Yeah, they said they were going to air it. It's happening for sure. Um, they said uh, that uh, you know it, it, it's such a massive comeback story and it, it it's going to impact the world. You know, they, I didn't have to win the national tournament. I, I won. The, I won. I, it's it's a massive comeback, and so uh, they did a great job at telling the story. You know, it was it was uh, great interviews. Um, they talked about the right stuff. Um, they they really took it to another level. And so um, they aired it about six months later, and and um, you know I got feedback from it. You know I started getting emails, I started getting messages, and, and it, it really started reaching people. You know I didn't know at the time that uh, it was going to turn into what it is today. You know ten years later, um, but uh, you know it uh, it ended up getting voted the most inspirational comeback film of the year, and that's how we got the Emmy Award. Incredible. How does that Emmy make you feel? Uh, <laughs> I know you carry it around with you, which is great. You show the kids when you go to the schools, but yeah, it's. Um, I can only imagine. You know, I, I I raise the bar in everything I do. You know, that one's that's irreplaceable. That's that's changed my life. It's changed my life. You know, I've gotten. You know, it, it says a lot about. It says a lot about. It's not the award. It's not the award. It's you know, and 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 I hold. I believe this. I have a national title too over the years. It's not the awards. What it is, it's who I became in the process to get there. Okay, that's what you have to understand. It's much bigger than that, and I've learned that, and I've internalized that because that is great to talk about. It sits nice in my trophy case. I get to pass it around to the kids, and it's 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 a massive accomplishment. But it, re it represents much more, and that's the person that you are today. It's huge, yes. What I went through to get there, the focus, the discipline, stay in the course, not ever, ever falling for them peer pressures again, not letting anything influence me away from my primary goal, and that was to be a national champion. That was to stay sober. That was to keep moving forward, become a man of integrity, and keep doing it, being a great father. It's what I, who I became in that whole process. That's the real championship. That's the real medal, you know? And it was life-changing to, you know, become that athlete, compete and train over the last 10 years. It was life-changing, you know? That's the real medal. That's the real gold. Because I don't just, my kids, my family, the community, everybody reaps those rewards of who I became and the impact that I'm gonna, that, that I'm having it much bigger than, than, I mean, that's massive, but it's much bigger than that. It's much bigger. So I'm curious, uh, by this time, your family, old friends, are people now reaching back out to you, reconnecting? You sounds like you, you surround yourself with really good people. How did, how did your life change from that standpoint, where you were at your worst point, to now the new Rich Jensen? Well, you know, I know it took a few years. Um, it took a few years to really work on myself and really become the person that I wanted to be, that I always wanted to be, um, and become that father, become a, a, a husband and, and a man of integrity. And it took, uh, it took years of, of working on myself and years of making good choices and years of, 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 of you know, following through on commitments and decisions and when I knew I had hit a benchmark was when my daughters finally called me dad you know that was that was one of the hardest things to go through is be patient step back and recognize that my daughters need to go through their process you know I, I robbed them of time and uh, they called me Rick for a couple of years and uh, and that was one of the biggest uh, uh, biggest wins of all was that you know um, it took a, it took time before they felt safe and comfortable and, and, and knew that I wasn't going to let them down and and um, present in their life and they could count on me and um, comfortable enough to call me dad daddy finally you know and it took a few years and I've been clean 14 years now and um, I remember when uh, when I started speaking 
you know this is this is kind of the the where the shift really happens okay it wasn't the emmy award it wasn't the espn documentary i mean that was big they were big big instrumental moments but where the shift kind of happened was um was about 2009 the documentary came out about a year prior um 2009 was when the big shift happened and and i've been um um you know i've been sober about five years now um i graduated from college i got my uh certificates i was done competing uh for the college went in to compete with the veterans um but uh i got a, i went to my post office box one day and i opened it up and it was full of letters there was 25 letters in my post office box and i reached in there and pulled them out and i and I, i'm looking at them and it looks like a bunch of kids writings you know you could tell it was kids you know and so i open them up and um and I'm reading these letters from kids in the eighth grade, seventh and eighth grade class from Queensbury, New York. And, um, you know, they were saying, uh, here's what happened. The, the, the teacher took the ESPN documentary, played it in the classroom and said, we're going to do a, le a class lesson around it. And so they had to write what they learned about from the documentary. What are the life lessons? Tell Rich Jensen a story. Tell him your goals. Ask him a question. This was the... The curriculum. This was the the class lesson around the ESPN document, my this documentary about my story, and so uh, so I'm in tears. I'm reading some of these stories the kids are telling me, and I'm just I'm I'm overwhelmed with emotion. You know, I was crying, and I was like, Oh my God, these. So I went home, and at the you know my wife today, but my my girlfriend at the time, I said, Look at these kids. They're you know look at this. Look what they did, and. Um, you know, the idea was to write them back and answer the questions. And so I called the principal out of Queensbury Middle School, Richard Keyes, and I called him on the phone and I said, hey, uh, your, your, you guys, your kids did a class lesson on my story and he knew exactly who I was. And I said, man, I'll, me and my wife want to jump on a plane and come out there. I don't want to write these kids back. I want to come meet these kids. And so, um, and I'd never spoken in a large group yet <laughs> at all. So, um, it's a great story because this is where it begins. This is where Be a Champion in Life was created. Um, you know, we, uh, we jumped on a plane. We planned two weeks out. We we're going to take a vacation out in New York. We'd never been there. We we're going to go speak to 850 seventh and eighth graders. And so, uh, so they welcomed us big time. I went out there and we, uh, we spoke, I shared my story. We played the documentary. and. I shared my story to about seven, eight hundred and fifty, eight hundred fifty seventh and eighth graders on the gym floor, and um, and it went really well for first time ever doing it. I was nervous, stomach was turning. I'm like, oh man, you know, you, um, kids judge. You know, you're, am I going to be able to deliver it? Are they going to get the message that I want to share? You know, and uh, a little insecure, but man, we did it. We did it, and then. Uh, and then I met all these uh, kids that wrote me the letters in a private session, and I got to answer them in person. And um, it was just the most powerful experience. And I went home inspired to create Be a Champion of Life and, and go share with more kids, you know, educate them about the dangers and talk about, you know, the solution and, and, and the comeback story and, and, and just share what I've learned over the years and making bad choices and what addiction's done to me. And with all these years clean, I bring a lot of value when it comes to why and, and making good choices. Yeah. Wow, what a remarkable story. Um, the fact that that teacher had them do that is incredible. And I think it's a good lesson there for any teacher, really anyone in life, that um, when you take the time to write someone, uh, not an email, actually pull out a pen a real letter write a letter uh, look how touching that it sounds like that was the aha moment for you that totally changed your life oh I, it was it was massive it was like turning a corner you know um, the impact that those kids had on me and then the experience I had while I was there so I went out there and, uh, so let me add to that okay because this is a big part of where where Be a Champion was created. So I go out there and um, I'm talking to the 
to these kids and there's a kid named Stevie in the crowd, okay? Come to find out he's really got, hasn't got much of a chance, you know? His family's really messed up in drugs, and jail, and this poor little Stevie in the seventh grade, you know? And, um, and he shared his story with me and the principal told me a little bit about it and um, I set up an interview with ESPN on that same tour because I was in town. I said, hey, I'm going to speak. I went up to Connecticut and uh, we did a live interview. They played the documentary again on national television. And, and um, you know, during that interview, and I still think about it today, you know, this is 10 years later. The reason I do what I do is because little Stevie might be in that crowd to receive my message, and it might change his life. The very f so little Stevie that I met in that very first time I ever shared my story, I carry that with me for the last 10 years, and I think about little Stevie out there. And so when the kids, when there's a kid or two crying in the audience when I'm talking about abandoning my kids or drug addiction or jail, or you know, I'm connecting with these kids, I think about that's why I do it, because that one kid's life might change. And very likely there is a little Stevie in every school. Absolutely. Uh, powerful stuff. So, um, be a champion in life. Where'd the name come from? I love it. Well, actually, uh, you know, in the beginning, it was it was uh, kind of Lost Dreams Awaken. It's kind of the what the brand started, you know, and over time. Uh, starting, you know, over time, over a few years, we started creating the brand, creating the mission, figuring out who we are, what we're trying to do out there. And, and over time, you know, I realized that that says everything about who we are. That says everything about our mission and everything about what we're trying to um, share out there is that uh, it's about being a champion in life. It's much bigger than one decision. It's about making good choices in every aspect of your life and being a person of integrity, you know? And so um, that's really, that's, that's our mission is to uh, encourage kids to join our team of champions. And can you talk through the program itself? Uh, what, when you go into a school, for example, what are you doing? Are you, are you, are you going in, uh, giving a speech in, in, in the gym or the auditorium, uh, or is it more than that? Yeah, sometimes, sometimes, um, you know, uh, sometimes, first off, let's say, um, you know, over 10 years, it's, it's turned into quite a um, busy year, you know, um, and sometimes I'll just do speeches to teams, I'll do speeches to parents and athletes, um, but our program, you know, where we really make the most impact, and, uh, and it's, we've built a program around it, and so what I do is I come in and I do a morning assembly share about my story, share about the dangers. And, and as of right now, um, the, the relevancy about the, the epidemic and the heroin and the prescription pills, you know? So now I'm talking about that, you know, as part of my presentation and trying to drive some of that home. You know, we're losing way too many kids. So, um, so I share my story in a way that connects at a very high level with these kids. You know, I'm able to encompass everybody in the room because everybody has a wrestling in their life, and that's where I open it up to more, more of the kids. Um, this isn't about wrestling. This is about finding your passion, you know? Um, and then we, we follow up in the afternoon with discussion groups in the classroom, some smaller one-on-one -on -one sessions, discuss the presentation, discuss questions and answers, and navigate some new topics. And then after school during wrestling season, I meet the wrestling team, and I have a little clinic with the team and, and a little speech about, wrestling and the importance of it and making good decisions outside the wrestling room and how to compete at an elite level, you know? And so by the end of the day, it's a full day program. By the end of the day, we're able to connect with these kids from different angles, you know? And I travel with the Emmy, so they get to take pictures. They follow us on Instagram and they help them stay engaged with what we're doing. And they all get wristbands. All the kids get rubber wristbands to join, be part of it, you know? And um, I eat lunch in the cafeteria. So it's, it's not a 40 minute speech and then you're gone. We could have been that guy. But what I realized is I, I bring way too much value and I wanted to make change and I wanted to change the world. 
I believe that we can change the world. I believe that wholeheartedly. And that's what we're doing. We're doing that out there. If you're gonna fly me across the country to come talk to your kids, we're gonna spend the day and figure out how we can reach these kids from different angles. Yeah. So, yeah. What's the response like? Oh, it's, it's incredible. I, I, you know, um, first off, you know, you, I gauge my, my um, impact by how many kids actually are in tears during the assembly, you know. Um, when you talk, these kids are, are reaching out for something. They're, and when they hear something that affects them, they can relate to in their life, um, maybe insecurities, you know, maybe anxiety, maybe a, a, an absent dad, you know, when I talk about robbing my kids of time and being absent from my kids' life and abandoning them. These kids that have experienced that feel that. You know, when I talk about addiction and, and maybe their, their parent or their friend or their family is, is using drugs. Um, and uh, when we're pulling at their heartstrings and they're feeling it and they uh, feel compelled to talk to me afterwards and share a story with me that they've probably never shared with anybody else in their life, feel comfortable to do that, we've changed that kid's life. And, um, and that happens all the time. Yeah, and hence the name. Uh, you know, that's, you're, you're really doing something wonderful. Um, and, you know, I think that it's really powerful when you could share your story. And, and I, when we were talking earlier, I believe you called it the power of story. Um, story is really powerful. Um, that's the theme of, of American Real. You know, our tagline is everyone has a story. Mm -hmm. Everyone does have a story. You have a powerful story. And for those kids to, first of all, break down and cry if you, if you touch something and then talk to you after about something that they may have never shared before, um, it's, that's when you know you're making significant change. And uh, I'd just like to know your thoughts on, on story. You know, why is story so important? Well, it, you know, it's that human connection. Um, you know, you have to realize I've, you know, I started speaking 10 years ago. And um, today we speak to over 20 to 30,000 kids a year, or people, you know. Um, it's, and what I've learned through that process, I'm on a 50-day speaking tour too, by the way. I don't, you know, um, we're, uh, we're impacting a lot of people right now. And um, what I've learned in the process, though, is, is how the connection between that story, that connection, but not just kids, but adults, like they can relate to different facets of the story. This isn't just about drug addiction. This is about insecurities. This is about anxiety. It's about depression. It's about um, sports. It's about accomplishing your goal. It's about fighting through the struggle. Um, it's about creating a vision and not ever giving up. It's about persistence. And, you know, when I bring, when I talk about it, when I share about it, when I do my program, you know, these kids and these parents and these people relate to some facet of it. And it connects at such a high level because it's a real story. It's tangible. It's touchable. They can relate to the struggle. They can relate to the perseverance. They can relate to the, to all of it, you know? Um, and when we can connect with people like that, we can change lives. And that's what we, we've done. We've done that. Um, because I'm just like everybody else. I'm just like everybody else. You know, the struggle is real. I think we all want the same thing. We all just want to be wanted, needed, accepted, included. All of us. It doesn't matter if you're 10 or 100. That's all we want, you know. And, um, and when you start talking about that stuff, people buy in. They buy in. Because deep down, that is what we want. And there was a time not too long ago, right, where you wouldn't have wanted to share your story. Right? I mean, it, it, took, it took those things that happened in your life to get you to where you were, to be comfortable and confident enough 
to share your story, which is now literally changing people's lives. Yep. You know, you, you, I wouldn't want to talk about it. You know, it's embarrassing. It's a shame. And uh, but as I started to stay clean and accomplish some goals and find some success and find some self-esteem. And then looking at the world today and understanding the dynamics and understanding the struggles these kids have and um, understanding the value that I bring because of the experiences I've been through in making bad choices. And then looking at the last 14 years, I just crested 14 years. And so looking at making good choices for 14 years, overcoming every single odd that there was, breaking all the rules, all of them, wrestling, sobriety this long, family, business life, speaking, breaking all the rules and finding the kind of success I have through making good choices and making it the most important thing. Now I bring a lot of value in making good choices. And so for me to sit home and sit on my hands with all that information that I have and all the value I can bring to people's lives and inspire and, and create change and, and create visions in people's lives that we can accomplish anything we put our minds to, you know, and that change that we can change the world. That's the thing we can. And so, um, I didn't want to be that guy that sat home. I couldn't sleep at night if I had to sit home on my hands. So I wanted to go out and, and, and it's a movement. I wanted to go out and change the world. So Rich, what, what do you say to those people that are, those guys that are home right now sitting on their hands that don't have the confidence and they may have never touched a drug in their life or may have never gone to prison but they don't feel their story matters. They don't fear, feel their life matters. They don't feel they're worth anything to anyone. What advice do you have to those people? Well, that's okay. So, so now we're talking about separation. That's part of the problem. We have too much separation in the world. Too much figuring out the different, the, 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 you know, the, the differences and, and not focusing on the similarities of people, you know, and similarities of wants and needs. And, and honestly, like, uh, you know, um, I believe that, uh, the change starts right here. You know, we can all, we can all make change. We can all become better people. I don't care who you are. We can all make more positive choices. We can all influence others to make good choices. We can unite, come together. Like right now, we need to come together. We need to badly. We have too much separation in the world. We have some serious demise right now. Um, we got a big problem on our hands with the heroin epidemic. We got a big problem with the pills, you know, fentanyl and, you know, people are dying, but um, I think that everybody, everybody has an opportunity to be part of the solution. Everybody does. You just got to sit back and figure out where you, where it fits in. You know, everybody can be part of the solution. You must have something inside you that. Um, you were able to, to gather some strength at some point to be able to do what you did, okay? I mean, this is rare uh, for us to be sitting here for everything you went through. I'm proud of you, and I don't even know you. Thank you. My question is, um, do, you know, is it, did you sit up late at night in prison? Did, was it on the gym floor? I mean, do you still, I mean, do you talk to yourself about how, wh where does the strength come from? Well, so, um, you know, there's going to be, you know, we all have challenges in our life. You know, we all have obstacles. And, um, you know, I think that everybody has it in them. I had to dig really, really deep. You know, I had to dig deep to stay sober. I had to dig deep to fight through the pain and the anguish and the, and the um, despair and the embarrassment and the anxiety of trying to get clean and then trying to be on the wrestling team and then try to, you know, find success on the wrestling team and then trying to push to create, be a champion in life and then not only have this vision, but actually try to stay after it and work for it and, and, and make it a reality and go change the world, change lives. Um, but... Uh, 
I think everybody has it in them. You just got to tap into it. You just got to dig a little deeper than you've dug before, you know? You might feel like you've done everything you can do. You might feel like you've done everything and you deserve the win. I, I talk about that sometimes, about, you know, you trained your butt off and you made all the right decisions and you deserve to win. You feel like you've earned it. You might not get it then. You might have to dig a little deeper. But if you stay the course and keep after it, the win's going to come. It's going to come over time. But I think we all have it in us. I think we all have the ability to dig a little deeper when we want something bad enough, when we're passionate about something, when it drives you, you know, just dig a little bit deeper. And it's hard work, right? It is. It's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of discipline. You got to stay the grind. You got to stay focused. You, for me, I had to not let, not get off track too far. I had a vision. I had goals, um, and and you couldn't veer off too far. You had to keep keep the focus in sight. Where you're going, what you're trying to do. Figure out a pathway to get there, and then start taking the steps without going off path too far. I'm after it. That's my vision. That's my goal. I'm going to work for it. I'm going to keep moving forward and I'm going to stay focused. And I think the hardest thing is to stay focused for people. You know, task at hand, stay focused. That's the vision. I think a lot of people take on too much or they get too far off this way when that's your primary goal right there. Why are you going way over there? That's the, you know, is it that important? Does it mean that much to you? Well, it meant that much to me. It meant that much. So I was able to stay focused on it. And, you know, and I had all them years dragging, I had all those years on my shoulders too, or, or in my backpack, you know, my luggage. All those years, and I knew that I never wanted to go back there again. And I knew that, uh, that I wanted to find success at whatever level that meant. Now, I didn't know what level of success I was gonna find, but I knew that I never wanted to ever take a chance and go back to that place again, ever. And so if I stayed the straight and narrow and I stayed focused on something bigger, something more positive, something more successful and tried not to get off, if I stayed, stayed tuned in, then, uh, then I'd probably be pretty safe, you know, and here we are. So what's next? What's next for your, which is now uh, an organization, right? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, I don't know if I said that earlier, but we're, we speak to 25, 30,000 people a year now. Um, I'm on a 50-day speaking tour. Uh, we went from uh, Oregon to Oklahoma. We're in New York this month, and then we're down to New Jersey, Pennsylvania, then out to Idaho, and then back home. Um, and uh, I think last year our biggest tour was uh, was 23 days, something like that. We talked to about 20,000 people last year. This year it's going to be over that. Um, and uh, so I'm in the midst of a very, very emotionally draining uh, speaking tour. But it's been it's been great. It's been empowering. It's been inspiring. Um, we're just finishing up the final touches on our book. It comes out early 2018. I've been working on that for seven years, and it's time. Great. It's what, time. What's the name? Same name? Be a Champion in Life, the story of Richard Jensen. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to add that to our brand, you know. Um, we won a national title last year, so that's in there. You know, finally accomplished that goal. Um, so, uh, you know, it's going really well. You know, we, we've, uh, we're, we're out changing lives daily. Um, you know, we're empowering uh, not only kids, but adults too, but a lot of kids. I do a lot of stuff with youth. My goal is to um, educate the next generation on the dangers, educate the next generation on the epidemic, educate the next generation that you have an opportunity to join our team and be a champion in life, you know? And hopefully what will happen is, you know, what we're doing is we're creating a change so that the next generation has a better chance at finding success because right now it doesn't look good. And so we're going to keep doing what we're doing, you know. Because We've, this generation really wasn't educated, right? Yeah, yeah. I so mean, that's what you're trying to do. It's lack of education on, yeah. on the dangers. It's lack of education. There's, there's a little module in school. There's not much there. And, and I think that, you know, a lot of parents don't know how to educate them about it, don't know much about it. But so with the experience I have, I'm out there um, educating the kids. Um, I've insulated myself with some great team members, great partners, Adidas Wrestling and Trails to Prevention. And, you know, that helps me do what I do. It helps, you know, to have good, positive team members that believe in your mission. And so um, that's helping elevate our game a little bit and giving us a little more opportunity and, uh, and giving us a better chance to reach some kids, you know. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, it's good. Our book's coming out, and we're gonna um, we're gonna hit thirty thousand kids this year. That's incredible. So, yeah, good yeah. work, Rich. If you could go back 
and talk to your 20 year old self that was in Alaska on those fishing boats, what would you tell him? I'd tell him, you know what? You have an opportunity to, to, um, to change your future. Don't pick up a drug, don't pick up a drink, you know, at all, no matter what, no matter what. And I promise you, you'll be the best version of yourself. You will have an opportunity to find the most, the highest level of success and your life will be so much more enjoyable. Don't ever do it at all, at all. You know, that's it. Great advice. Well, this has been incredible. You have an amazing story. I'm so happy that we connected and we will stay connected. I promise. I know we will. Um, but before we let you go, one last question. And that is, uh, you're doing a lot of work. You're doing a lot of work. What do you want your legacy to be? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I mean, it, it, it's, it's not that complicating, you know. I actually, you know, want to change the world. And when I'm done, we will have done that. We will have done that, you know. The stigma's dead. It's not once an addict, always an addict anymore. It's not. We can change our lives. We can find the very highest level of success. We don't have to be that person. That doesn't have to drag with us. You know, it's who we are, who we become. You know, it's what we do from this day forward that determines who you are. And I'm going to change the world. Roger, I'm changing the world. I promise you. We're, we're on our way. It's going to be, it's different. Lives are changing. I love it. Rich, thanks so much. Thanks for being here. And welcome to the American Real family. Thank you. Thanks.